<clears throat> All right. Great. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. It's so nice to have a virtual meeting today. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of snow. So it's nice to not have to go anywhere, even though it's fun to see everybody in person. So thanks for joining us. Keep your questions top of mind. We want to have a discussion at the end of the presentation. So we left plenty of time for that. Um, and so here we go. Um, most of you know Dr. Amos Dinard. He is our true fluoride champion. He, we lost him in February of 22. Um, he was known nationally and probably internationally for his campaign to fluoridate every tooth of every child in America and beyond. Um, Dr. Amos was a pediatrician and held an emeritus professorship at the U of M Medical School um, until his passing. Um, he had a passion for public health, a passion for kids, a passion for the underserved. Um, and he was actually a fun and interesting guy too. So um, hats off to you, Amos. We're gonna try to do you proud. Next slide. Oh yeah, so this is me. Hello, silver diamine fluoride explained. Next slide. Um, we wanna thank Dr. Kwok who has supplied us, supplied us with several slides for this presentation. Um, he is a SDF and other um, preventive dentistry expert and a dentist himself. Um, and so we're just gonna give him a nod whenever we pull up one of his slides. Next slide. So what is SDF? So here I'm gonna to get to be my chemistry geek cell from undergrad, right? Some of you will be bored to tears. Um, I must say I'm not a very good chemist, but I'm fascinated um, about chemistry. So it is a heavy metal halide. Brush off all the chemistry knowledge, <laughs> heavy metal halide, silver diamine fluoride. Um, and so this is the molecular structure and I put the, the link to the reference in there. Next slide. So um, this is a Dr. Kwok slide, thank you. Um, silver and fluoride ions exist in this clear ammonia solution. Um, in fact, the ammonia, those two ammonium molecules that were on the previous slide, keep the solution at a constant concentration for an extended period. So essentially acts as a stabilizer for the chemistry. Um, and 38% SDF is what's available in the US and it's what's, what is most widely studied um, as far as the accepted concentration for effective um, desensitization and caries management. Um, SDF was, and we might have a slide about this coming up, SDF has been approved by the FDA as a uh, desensitizing agent. So when we use it on decay, it's actually off label, um, but it's allowed. So I want to be clear about that. The other thing I want to say, kind of as a frame set, in 2019 in their global burden of disease um, report, I guess, World Health Organization said decay in permanent teeth is the most common burden of disease and most common health condition. Um, and so SDF, the reason we're having this talk is SDF works to um, slow and inhibit the progression of decay and allow teeth to be treated without a traditional dental treatment methods like a drill um, and a filling. Um, okay, next slide. Oh yeah, here it is, I'm ahead of myself. Um, yeah, in 2016, Advantage Arrest, which is a brand, um, the FDA said, yes, it is breakthrough therapy for the arrest of caries in children and adults. So it isn't exactly an approval but it is a designation that says 
Um, we recognize that this is an effective treatment and it would be unethical to not um, promote that information. Okay, next slide. Um, so the mechanisms of action, we already talked a little bit about the ammonia being a stabilizing agent for SDF. Um, SDF is alkaline. So brush off your pH chemistry from back in the day, right? So karyogenic bacteria, what does it give off? It gives off acid and the acid is what actually causes the tooth to break down. It's not the bacteria, the little bug itself, it's the byproduct of the bug that causes decay. So by having an alkaline solution, we're already neutralizing the effects of the bacteria before we even get started. Um, and we've shown that SDF inhibits the biofilm growth, um, particularly of these bacteria. Um, silver chloride is the main precipitate um, silver itself has been shown to destroy the cell wall of the bacteria. So it essentially blows up the bacteria. Mm -hmm. It's been shown to inhibit the enzymatic activity. So it changes the metabolism of the process of the bacteria and it inhibits the replication of the bacterial DNA. So it can't progenerate, right? And so it's a pretty remarkable finding and you know, I think there's things about SDF we don't exactly understand how it works, but those are some of the things that we do understand. Um, no, no, so no. it inhibits collagen degradation, it um, promotes fluorohydroxyapatite crystal formation. Um, and again, that alkaline piece I think is, is pretty important. Dr. Maytan, can I just interrupt for one second and ask everybody to mute themselves? I'm hearing a little bit of background noise that um, is interfering. So if everybody wouldn't mind doing that, unless you have a question, that'd be great. Thank you. Next slide. So yeah, so again, here's my chemistry geeky self coming through. Um, and like biochemistry, when we had to draw like the um, you know cycles of different different things, but what essentially happens is that thiol amino acid in the bacterial circle at the bottom um, and the nucleic acid, the silver nitrate joins with it, and what you end up with is the nitrate, and then this silver amino acid, which doesn't really do anything to the tooth, right? You're changing the proteins. And so when the proteins are changed, the mechanism of action of the bacteria and the ability of the bacteria to replicate has gone away. And then in the rectangle at the top, so hydroxyapatite, right, is part of the matrix of the tooth. Um, and when you add in the fluoride, it makes fluoroapatite, which is stronger, and it um, inhibits the calcium dissolution from the lesions. lesions. So the SDF actually um, prevents the calcium from leaching out. It's pretty cool. Okay, next slide. Um, and so this just recaps what we've just talked about. Um, I think it's pretty interesting that the silver precipitate that comes off from that graph on the last page, um, it actually blocks the dental tubules, right? And then the microorganisms, i.e. bacteria, and the acid from that bacteria can't get in to the tubules, so it can't reach the pulp, right? So um, I guess this is a case when I was studying for all of my analytical chemistry exams in college and thought, why am I doing this? This is why. So we can talk about SDF in a meeting. Um, next slide, Nancy. Okay, any questions right off the top for me before I pass it over? I don't see anything in the chat at this time. Okay, great. Dr. Jahani Kandori, it's all yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maiden. 
Um, next slide, please. All right, so basically what we're focusing here is to show that how much SPF has been studied in uh, publications, how many articles has been there, uh, what does it do, and what is basically is showing all these studies. To my um, uh, findings and also uh, uh, basically, I, I didn't really know anything much about it in the past, but um, based on my research and based on the article search that I did, there's a vast number of articles that has been dedicated to show how SDF has been effective for um, management of caries. Um, there are some studies that also raise the importance of the minimal invasive uh, dentist dentistry and also preventative dentistry uh, that this uh, product can offer. And uh, also, so there, the vast majority of the uh, studies are done on children, but then also some has been focused on older adults as well, which I feel like that uh, this would, that's a potential for this product um, to be worked at more, especially that um, we have a few clinical trials that showed on the uh, elder adults, uh, especially those with high risk. Um, and those with limited to no access of the dental services um, due to economic, social, social or even um, like functional challenges. And so they may be benefit from this as well. Uh, the few studies have shown beneficial, which is amazing, but I think that there is an opportunity for more case study to be done from that perspective. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned that the majority of the studies are done for children. Um, there are many systemic reviews and meta-analysis that showed that they're effective um, more than uh, other treatments uh, such as or, or placebo in arresting of the caries in primary teeth. Um, also some of the studies have shown, which I found it yesterday, I was looking at it, that showed up to 89% arrest compared to placebo. So that's, that's very promising. Um, there are a few studies have uh, focused on the adverse effect of the product, mainly the black staining, that it's a potential disadvantage, uh, but then also uh, mentioning that most of the parents are favorable to select the SDF over the invasive techniques. It's because of the easy access, um, easy ap uh, application, and then it's painless and safe. Next slide, please. I do have one question for you um, about that. So when you say that it's painless, so it obviously stops the decay, but if this decay is significant enough, there obviously the, the person would be experiencing pain. So does it help with that too? Or I mean, what extent of decay are you able to use SDF for? I think part of it is that I, I can answer to some extent, but I, I'm sure Dr. Maiden would um, be having a better answer. But I think part of the product is desynthesizing uh, that, that we use it for the uh, for the carriers as well. So that can help with the pain. Uh, but then uh, I will let Dr. Maiden if she has uh, more information regarding that. Right, so the remember the dental tubules get blocked. So that's the big, the big factor and it helps prevent the progression of the disease towards the pulp. Um, now we know that sometimes one application is not enough, right? Like it might slow it, but it might not stop it totally or, you know, so, um, so Deb will be talking about this in a little bit, but the sometimes multiple applications on the same tooth are required. Um, in Minnesota Medicaid, FYI, we pay for SDF on up to five teeth per visit and once every six month per tooth number. Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Maiden. Um, yes, studies as showed and moving forward, um, showing that it, they are effective for root caries as well. Um, 
the aim of basically all these studies are that they show that the effectiveness of the um, SDF and how feasible its application is um, by having access uh, to this product, it's just feasible and accessible for even physicians to uh, treat early childhood caries as well. Next slide, please. And I do see a comment in the chat box that if the pain is from an infection, the SDF will not stop the pain. And so Dr. Maytam just said, thank you for the clarification on that, Dr. Olson. Thank you so much. Um, yes, SDF is recommended. Um, this has been uh, recognized by World Health Organizations, uh, especially that dental caries is being a global public health problems. So um, this product has been recognized internationally as well because it's a newer product, it's minimally invasive and it's cost effective. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the application of the, um, so, uh, the SDF um, and also just the, the, the instruction on how to use it and management, there are some studies that have done also to compare the application by nursing versus the dental hygienist. And they, uh, they have seen that they have the same efficacy. Uh, it was a smaller number of patients that it was studied, about uh, 500 patients. But then uh, also said that efficacy that applied uh, no matter what the personnel is, as long as they have the training to do it, uh, it will be effective. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to read about the uh, American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry um, statement regarding the SDF um, in which that they support the use of the SDF as part of an ongoing caries management plan with the aim of optimizing individual patient care uh, consistent with the goal of the dental home. Um, they support the third-party reimbursement for fee associated with the SDF. Uh, they also support uh, delegation of, uh, of application of the SDF to auxiliary dental personnel or other trained uh, health professionals according to a state's dental practice. Um, and that comes with uh, training um, other staffs, uh, other professionals to be able to use this product. Next slide, please. And as they continue the support uh, for a consultation uh, with the patient and parent with an informed consent, recognizing that the SDF is a valuable therapy, which may be included as part of a caries management plan. And they support the education of dental students, residents, oral health professionals, and their staff to, to ensure a good understanding of appropriate coding and billing practice and encourage more uh, practice-based researchers to be conducted on the SDF to evaluate its effic uh, eff efficacy, which I think there is a lot of opportunities at least uh, there to be done for broader patients, including uh, vulnerable patients, uh, vulnerable com communities, especially in the rural settings that uh, we don't have a lot of access to uh, dental homes for our patients. Next slide, please. American Association of Pediatricians also uh, suggesting that pediatricians who are familiar with the science of dental caries, capable of assessing the uh, caries risk, comfortable with applying various strategies of the prevention and intervention, um, uh, connected to the dental resources and familiar with the social determinant of children's uh, health can contribute to the health of their uh, parent, uh, patients, which that brings up the importance of uh, us as a primary care providers um, having the knowledge of uh, dental health added into our training and be able to use that in order to uh, help our patients more. Um, dental caries is such a common and conse uh, consequential disease process in the pediatric population and such an integral part of the overall health of the children. And it is essential that the pediatrician includes oral health in their daily practice of pediatrics. Next slide, please. 
So I, I'm sorry to keep interrupting. There's some good questions that are coming up and I want to interject them here where they're appropriate. But um, so my first question is, is there a standardized training for SDF compared to just basic fluoride? And then it, it, the question that I received in the chat is at one point there were issues with nurses applying fluoride without a license or without that training. Um, so is that a consideration and does someone need an official training verification in order to be able to bill for that? May I may I ask that we hold those and address them at the end when we're talking okay, about it? Okay, sure, Deb. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, we're going to address all of those uh, at the end of the um, session. Okay, so the other, um, nope, sorry, back. <laughs> thank you. So basically, um, they recognize, uh, the American Association of Pediatrician recognized SDF that is minimally invasive, low cost liquid solution that is basically painted on the lesion. Um, in young children, it provides a non-surgical techniques to manage um, caries lesions until the child can cope with the traditional restoration, restorative dental care, and potentially avoid the sedation and general anesthetic. And that's the support that they have from the SDF. Uh, of course, there's still many other um, uh, applications and needs uh, uh, and work needs to be done in order uh, for that to move forward. But that's a good start. Um, next slide, please. So my takeaway from this, uh, at least, would be that um, oral health is the healthcare. Um, mouth is important to health as the entryway to the body's digestive and respiratory tract. A uh, healthy mouth sets uh, body's functioning. For oral health can indicate the systemic um, general health problems. For example, oral lesions might indicate HIV infection and some other lesions uh, like a, a periodontitis um, uh, might be associated with uh, cardiovascular diseases. Um, mouth also serve important social role, expressing pain and joy, um, talking and smiling. Um, the way that our mouth functions and looks um, influences how people respond to us and how we orient ourselves to the world. Um, so given the profound importance of our mouth, both to our health and to our functioning in the world, why does not our health system and health professional uh, curricula treat the mouth as something that are separate from bodies and treat dentistry as something that is separate from medicine? Um, in the United States, primary care generally includes family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, and uh, collectively involves the responsibility for comprehensive care of the patients regarding their age, gender, race, uh, and illness. We try to provide comprehensive whole person care um, across the life is, uh, lifespan of, of, the, um, of these patients and uh, with an effort to address all health inequ uh, inequity, social, economic, and environmental dependent of health. Um, addressing patients' oral health would fall within our framework as well, especially that given the prevalence and severity of the oral disease in the United States. And then uh, one more comment that I have is that, that many people in the United States may see a primary care physician, uh, but not a dentist due to the societal inequalities and disproportionately impacted vulnerable communities, uh, making the interactions with their physicians probably the only chance for an oral exam and preventative advice. And so it's important that this to be recognized and use any tools that we have in our basket uh, to decrease this uh, disparity gap. And that would be it. For All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Matian and Dr. Jahani. So everybody, you've heard from a geek, a chemistry geek dentist who uh, knows uh, special needs patients and 
uh, dental policy and uh, public programs. And you've heard from a pediatrician who is all about whole person care and interprofessional education and care delivery. Um, and I think that lays the background for uh, my what I'm gonna go through quickly and try to plant a few seeds for our discussion here, the how and why to apply SDF. Next slide, please. And this isn't gonna be a big primer and the question came up and I think we should follow up uh, through the coalition website with a bunch of resources for things, how to do this, including, and this is a little bit of a preview, um, part of the reason why we're having this conversation is the fact that uh, there will be a CPT code for medical providers to begin providing this. And I think July might be the date that it's active and the, the 2023 code book isn't even out yet. <laughs> Um, but will be soon. So I can't tell you the number of that, but there will be a code. And uh, perhaps in the discussion, Dr. Maytan can, can talk about whether there's discussions at DHS about reimbursing for it. So this isn't going to be, I'm going to show you some quick things, but the, the main thing I want uh, to tell you in advance, what I want you to take away from this is you've heard that it, there's a lot of reason to believe it works, both in the science of it and the, and the uh, studies that have been done, and that tooth decay is a far too prevalent problem and that we have a system where if we can halt that and get people out of pain and not have disease get worse, then we can, uh, the, the system, the existing system and the expansions of the system can go further. And um, so as a hygienist, th this is such an exciting thing for me. So anyway, now I'll get back onto the slides. So this is just one product, uh, SDF, and shows that you can purchase it in a, a bottle where it's dispensed like in that little blue cup and, or you can get a slightly more expensive, but perhaps more convenient individual doses of it. And they come with micro brushes. And so it's, this is uh, not as complicated as many things that the providers that might be doing this uh, would otherwise do. So next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to read these, but there they are, and this will be in your handouts if you want to do this. But again, there's a lot of resources and videos to watch how it's done uh, online. And uh, just making the point again that this is, you know, there's a drying and a and applying and a good buying. It's it's pretty fast uh, type of thing. Next slide, please. The last item on that was about the staining. Um, this actually is good because somebody asked, or it was brought up that you might need to uh, apply it more than once. And this is a slide from Dr. Kwok that just shows keeping a tooth from, uh, looks like it had been sealed, but not all of the grooves were sealed. So they applied SDF and it uh, did not advance in those that, that period of four years. Next slide, please. Um, these are going to be some pictures uh, of cases that were done at Apple Tree, just so that you can see the staining of the decay. It does not in, uh, stain the entire tooth. It stains the active decay, the decalcification and so on. So you can see how it looked before, that chalky white. And this one actually looks like it has a little bit of cavitation. And then in the next one, how it looks uh, dark. Next slide, please. Uh, here is a case that was done and that quite a bit of uh, the enamel gone there and how it looked when it was um, treated and the disease was treated, the decay was arrested, and then how the restoration restored the form and function of that, the appearance and so on. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Maytan provided these, and these are three more examples. So you can see there's the gum line, there's between the teeth, and there's the biting surface of the teeth, and there are applications for SDF on all of those. Sometimes it's the definitive uh, treatment. Let's say that one of those uh, baby teeth were going to be lost soon. Might be That might be it, and at least you aren't uh, having all of that uh, bacteria preparing the environment for uh, new targets on, on permanent teeth, but you're getting that under control. So might be the final thing, might be that a, a tooth colored restoration gets placed. Um, it can be definitive or an interim step. Next slide, please. The staining is not just for the decayed areas, it's for clothing, it's for surfaces. This is a tray cover in dentistry. And I love this picture. I, uh, I took it because to me, what this picture shows is there was a drop or two that somehow got onto the tray cover and then somebody 
uh, wiped it up and and made it into a bigger thing. Kind of nice looking, but uh, and there are different things that are available online that say uh, if you get at it right away with an ammonia based, you know, like a Windex or something that will take it off. And I think maybe something with the magic erasers. But the main thing is uh, be careful, be cautious and, you know, don't fling it around or wipe it around. Next slide, please. So these are the these are some of the concerns that as Dr. Jahani and Dr. Maytan and I were thinking about, you know, what are the concerns that people might have? There, so there's the staining. You do have to train staff. And we had already had a question about that. Um, I think some states have put into their legislation or into their scope of practice what kind of training is necessary. And uh, I saw that Bridget was on and she may want to speak to this in the Q&A time. Uh, about how far that goes or doesn't go, um, but at any rate. Also, there's just the workflow. Everyone is busy, most people are understaffed. And so how do you incorporate that into the protocols? Dr. Jahani spoke uh, eloquently in our planning about how there are standard things that uh, the provider and the patient discuss. The provider goes on and one of their staff members comes in and gives the vaccination. That's how it was for my flu shot this year and, and so on. So, um, but there you do have to develop that workflow, the available time, we all know that one. And then this last one led us to a really exciting uh, epiphany that I hope will be part of our discussion. Um, we have these siloed records that make it difficult to do whole person care and to know where things are. And uh, I know that there, um, Dr. Maytan may uh, speak about it in the Q&A, um, that there's uh, some states have, many states or maybe all states have registries for vaccines. And there was an effort in Minnesota that kind of got uh, uh, backburnered to have a registry for fluoride. You know, when we got fluoride varnish and then we got fluoride varnish being applied in many other settings, local public health and all the different places, wouldn't it be nice to have that central registry so you'd know how many that child had had and, and so on. Now, to me, we also have SDF and we also have uh, new providers that will be eligible to provide that. So is it time for us to, to break down some of those silos and see about a registry? Next slide, please. So now, to me, this is the why part, and this is what I hope we'll be talking about. There's always barriers. There's always more to be learned about uh, outcomes, which is part of why I'm advocating that we need to have uh, tracking and evaluation is so that we can learn even more about when SDF works and doesn't and what the differences are when it's applied by whom and where and all that. Um, but this health affairs is a very uh, respected uh, policy journal. And this is getting to be old already, 2019, but I think it's just as relevant. And you can see that there's a long cycle for we professionals to actually adopt new evidence. Um, and they call it right out and say, in the case of silver diamine fluoride therapy, a simple and painless treatment alternative to drilling dental caries in children, we should move faster than 17 years. Next slide. And because I really like this stuff, uh, this is in here. We should consider the professional and moral obligation of medical and dental clinicians to provide children and their parents with all available and indicated treatment options. And this is just one of them. This is not uh, a silver bullet for absolutely everything. But when I think about how many practices get emergency calls and how many emergency rooms get people with uh, severe decay, this is something we can begin offering to, uh, to help people not be in pain, to help practices not have as many emergencies. We, we just need to have, we need to be thinking about this, not in a this or that, but yes and. So off my uh, horse. The next, the next slide, please. Now I want to open it up. These are our, uh, this is our contact information. We're happy to hear from everyone after this. Nancy will distribute our slides, but I, what I want us to engage in any specific questions, but also knowing that there's going to be a code for physicians knowing how we have worked on um, getting fluoride out there with Amos as our uh, um, leader on that. 
what can Minnesota do with this opportunity to address oral health in an interprofessional way that benefits all of our patients, medical, dental, public health, education, all of them. So with that, I think we're going to open it up for discussion. Wonderful. Oh, Faith Kidder has a registry comment to make. So Faith, if you want to go. Yeah, well, I want to just um, jump off on what Deb was saying too, because I think that there's, uh, I think SDF, we're just at the top of the crest of the wave that's just starting. So um, I think that there's things that'll be interesting and I'd love to hear from Dr. Maytin about whether DH, what, when DHS is going to start looking at um, Medicaid medical assistance reimbursement for SDF and um, just how this is all going to run. So. My experience with fluoride varnish is it doesn't happen overnight, but certainly I think one of the things for us to think about is training and um, how that goes. Cause I think really the way that you're going to, it's hard to really ask people to do something if they don't know how to do it. So um, that to me is a start, but as far as the registry goes, Okay, so I don't know who does any, where oral health is with uh, legislative advocacy, particularly this cycle, which is like such an awesome opportunity. Um, but what I really wanna encourage you to do, and somebody can reach out to me on the sidelines about this is, to work cross-sectionally with other organizations that also would like to do registries because mm -hmm. first of all, Mick is outdated. Um, Prashida, if she was on, and I don't think she is, we met with the people who did Mick and hey, basically- Wait, can you tell us what Mick is? Oh, uh, the Minnesota Immunization, I forget okay. what the C stands for, but it's basically the registration for, and I see Prashida is on it. Yeah. And remember, Prashida, we met with and had talked about adding on to Mick and, um, years ago, and they told us at that time it was an outdated platform that didn't easily incorporate other other uh, registries into it. And what we need is a registry platform where at least in childhood, we can monitor dental health, we can monitor developmental screening that's occurring, we can monitor hearing and vision screening that's occurring along with immunizations. And it would be great to have a registration platform that would allow this. And at first, some of those aspects might be opt-in for parents rather than opt-out like immunization is. But what it really, what I'd like people to think about in the next month or two as they're putting together their uh, legislative priorities is to think about reaching out to other organizations um, like the developmental screening folks and the hearing and vision screening um, to really like, approach the legislature together, or at least organized in a way where they, they will start looking at this as a real need that is really cross -sec sector um, rather than just one. Okay, I'm done, thank you. Oh, great, thank you. While we wait for the next person to unmute yeah. or whatever, um... Thank yeah. you, Faith. Those are really great. And I did fail to mention, in addition to all the things that are geared towards dental practices or community-based uh, dental uh, settings, uh, applying fluoride varnish, most people may know Smiles for Life, but it's an oral health curriculum that many medical providers use, kind of the gold standard. And by July, their intention is to have mm. an, uh, an SDF unit in that. So that'll be really great. And I'm sure we can work with Nancy to be sure that gets put out through the coalition when that's available. 
And and thank you so much for mentioning that, Deb, because I think that's a <clears throat> that's a really big deal. Yes, Prashida. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Faith, for that wonderful comment. And Dr. Meetan has already been working with some of our MDH partners to come up with a prototype. And there, there, there are opportunities to use existing database that are already popular with our medical colleagues. So instead of trying to add another database, we could mm -hmm. use it. But again, these are big IT projects which require funding and a lot of community support for us to be able to move this forward at the agency level. So what I am personally looking is more avenues where we can come together and we could go to MDH leadership and tell them that this is something that our communities are wanting and be able to show that business case because generally when whenever IT is involved, there is a lot of cost to it as well, right? So even though things seem possible, is it possible is a different question in terms of but we have already identified some of those infrastructure. The second thing is that because we don't know exactly what are our next steps. So we would be continuing uh, Dr. Amos um, legacy by convening Go Forth and Varnish uh, task force and some of our uh, medical colleagues, including Dr. Crespo, Dr. Erickson have already um, you know, uh, committed to being part of the committee. So I feel like, and Chris, uh, Chris uh, used to be, um, is still the program director for Crush Cavities program and worked very closely with Dr. Amos. So she has a small contract with MDH. So she will be convening the task force and bringing everybody together so we can talk about what is the next step we should be looking at. So I think there would be a space for us to talk more about these great um, uh, you know, comments that we are seeing in the chat box, but just wanted to let you know that that's in the pipeline. Thank you, Prashida. Um, I appreciate that. Good to hear you. Um, Jean Anderson, did you have a, do you want to share your question? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I'm finding this all very interesting and, uh, and, and stimulating and I, I love the conversation, but I, I, would, I wouldn't be me if I didn't bring this up because, and Deb's smiling because she knows me, but, um, you know, currently dental hygienists and collaborative practice are, uh, not allowed to provide SDF without a definitive diagnosis of caries for arrest, uh, use of SDF for arrest. Um, in a medical setting, what I envision, of course, is that neither the, de the doctor nor the nurse or whoever is going to apply this is really educated like a dentist or a dental hygienist to recognize decay. And I said recognize, I didn't say diagnose. Um, we choose our words carefully, um, but I would would really appreciate um, us revisiting the application of SDF by dental hygienists in public health settings when a dentist is not ready, readily available or cannot be done through telehealth because it's not available or whatever. Um, I think it's a travesty that this is not allowed at this time. I think we are very capable of recognizing uh, variations of normal, away from normal, in order to apply it for caries arrest. So I, I don't know if this is the platform for it, but um, you know this is, this is what I've been thinking about for a couple of years now, and I think it's a really important part of this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. And I think Deb had something. And so did Dr. Prashida. So uh, okay. do you want me to go first, Dr. Prashida? I would want Deb to go first. I'm going to add. <laughs> okay. This is exactly the forum, Jean. And um, I'm not always a glass half full person, but I actually feel like this is another opportunity to revisit that. And you may have noticed subtly in the slides that the pediatric dentist would like this to be after an exam by a dentist. Not every state requires that, and I can't spout off the um, which states allow a hygienist to do it, but I will tell you, and Claire Larkin is on this call, uh, she was a panelist with an MDA symposium about sealants, and there was a time when the sealants could not be done by a hygienist without a prior exam. So they looked at the evidence and the conclusion of that. I remember Paul Walker, pediatric dentist, standing up and uh, various other people um, saying, the harm of not allowing this so exceeds any risk of doing it that we are going to authorize this. 
And there were things in this, the presentations from the chemistry geek and the uh, pediatrician, and I guess in mine too, of showing you uh, that it is not a dangerous other than staining uh, procedure to do. And the wrinkle we didn't get into that I think uh, with the diagnosis or uh, recognition of deviation from normal uh, that you saw, there's a couple elements to that. Uh, my boss, Dr. Hogason, says SDF is kind of the ultimate disclosing solution. And you might not know whether you are preventing decay or arresting it until you apply it. And there are preventive benefits, especially those root surfaces in, in elders. There's a lot of evidence around that. So to me, um, and I'm not saying go out and just, you know, throw SDF on uh, in everyone's mouth, but I feel even less hung up about the diagnosis. I'm more interested in being able to track and see they did it in the physician's office. Maybe it's they're doing a carries risk assessment and deciding this person should have that. And then they do it and some of it's arrest and some of it's uh, preventative. But then don't I want to be able to know how many times that kid had that or that adult or whoever had that, how many times that tooth was treated and whether it subsequently needed a filling. Now I'm getting into... Uh, uh, Delta dental stuff, you know, like you want to know that a treatment is effective. Well, DHS does too. So that's another reason to have this registry. So we can give a lot of good information to researchers to look at what the ultimate outcomes are. And it, it sort of addresses your diagnosis thing, Jean, but I think this is exactly the, the time for us to be looking at collaborative dental hygiene practice in medical settings, other settings. I, I don't even know, because I think a lot of it is very practice and personnel specific. If you get an oral health champion, CNA or somebody, I want them doing it. If you yeah. have a practice that doesn't want to do it, but they would welcome having a hygienist in on their whichever clinic days or whatever, then that's great too. So I'm sorry, Dr. Rashid, I went on a little long there. Thank you. So I agree to everything that Deb said and because our coalition always provides that brave space for us to talk. So I'm going to put on my dental public health health hat and talk about signs and evidence, right? So silver diamond fluoride, if you technically look at the evidence that we have, has obtained the FDA clearance as a desensitizing agent. Let's start there. So if a product has been used off-label for DK or whatever, and we go back to the FDA clearance for using STF as a desensitizing agent, then dental hygienists are obviously within their scope of practice to do the work. And even when we place sealant in a community setting, there's always collaborative practice agreement. The value and the beauty of those agreement is that there's always a dentist to make or help make a determination whether the tooth should be sealed or referred. It's the same issue in the sealant, but over the time there has been calibration training. There has been a lot of communication between our hygienists or advanced dental therapists who work, who continue to work with dentists to make that determination, right? But the whole idea of using silver and diamond fluoride off-label is to arrest the caries because we know if you were at the school nurses conference and you would have met those nurses who told you that the, the, the ideal situation is that kids come to them with smaller abscess. You would advocate for our dental hygienist to place the, the you know, like the, the silver diamond for it, because the whole idea is equity, right? You have to make sure that you arrest the caries before they can find a dental home, unless we reach to a point where we are able to create dental homes for all the children, irrespective of their insurance status. I think that is really my public health you know, like calling to mm -hmm. everyone to consider those lens where we do talk about ideal things and everything, but there is scientific evidence and equity reason why this has to move forward. Thank you for that. And uh, Dr. Jahani, you have your hand up and then I have a question too, but I put my hand up. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so I just want to have a comment regarding the dental and medical integrative um, in our clinic. In Mankato, we do have a dentist and dental hygienist uh, three uh, days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, um, joining us in our clinic um, when we have a well child visit that coming, um, that they don't have a dental home, we provide the dental care here in our clinic for them. And so that can give us a little bit of the help in order to recognize and uh, uh, try to prevent but this is just a small setting at this point. Um, we do benefit for learning and training more staff to 
in order even for the application and such. And as uh, Deb mentioned that these are the stuff that we need to look into it and work toward it because the, the demand is high, especially in the rural setting. Thank you for that. I have a question. Um, how long does the discoloration or the black color remain on the tooth? On the decay forever. Okay. And I'll, just, and I'll just add that if it naturally did, if someone um, maybe was just using fluorides and maintaining a different pH in their mouth and the acid bath that caused the decay, um, that it would also, if it arrests nat quote unquote naturally, mm -hmm. it would also turn dark like that. Okay. So it's a phenomena. And I know in IHS, um, they would say things like, that's how we know it's working. Yeah. And someone, uh, maybe Dr. Jahani mentioned that uh, parents of kids and some adult patients as well are like at Apple Tree, it was a bigger hang up for the, the providers to let a tooth turn or a portion mm. of a tooth turn black than it was, you know, for the, uh, for the, you know, it is that whole thing. You mean I won't have to take them to the OR? You mean they don't have to have a shot? You mean that tooth is going to be lost? And that does not negate the need for informed consent. And I've got some really nice slides. We use photos on our informed consent, you know, kind of thing. So you do need for people to understand that that's how it's going to look and that when appropriate, there can be a cosmetic, once the disease is process is stopped, the cosmetic uh, solution can be added. That's super helpful. I, I really appreciate you um, sharing that and especially that informed consent. Um, I'm going to put the last couple of slides back up. Um, we've got three minutes. Any other questions? Um, there's one. Does the state require a training verification of any sort um, for medic any of any sort in order for Medicaid reimbursement? Sorry, I kind of screwed that up. Um, I'll take the Medicaid question. Thanks. So no. Um, and with respect to the question about is DHS talking about covering the CPT code? Yes, the answer is yes. The code is not out yet. It should be coming out this month. The codes will go into effect July 1st. My recommendation is going to be the same as it, as it is for fluoride varnish. We pay fluoride varnish the same amount in medicine as we do in dentistry. The coverage, you know, is the same. So it's going to, my recommendation to the internal powers that be is that we do the same for SDF, that the reimbursement's the same. Thank you. Um, we don't require anybody to submit their fluoride varnish smiles for life training to Medicaid. I don't think we're going to require it for SDF application. Thank you for that. We, the three of you really round out this discussion so well. You each have a, have a piece of this pie that's really helpful. Um, and I'm the first one to admit that I, I didn't know much. Um, Jean, do you have a Another comment or question? Yes, Dr. Maytan, are you just speaking of the use of S prevention or is this community? So Jean, half of what you said like wasn't there yeah. on for me. Okay. Um, and I can talk to you offline because we're out of time, but I will just say this, that we um, at DHS, if a physician charges SDF to DHS, we're not asking them to tell us if it was for prevention or for caries arresting. So I don't know if that's helpful, but you're frozen. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, I'll just dovetail on that. We and are, oh, do follow sorry. up with us, Jean. Oh, Bridget. Bridget's gonna say something, but I do just wanna say that uh, there is a separate code for prevention. It is not currently covered. And that is another one where we don't necessarily get all the information we'd really like to have to understand. But again, you may not know whether you're preventing or arresting until after. And I see Bridget and Nancy have. Yeah, Bridget. Yeah, I mean, I was I was really just going to speak to that too about there, you know, there is a separate coding. I mean, as far as the duty itself, we do not differentiate what it's being used for. And you know, basically they're allowed to do the application. So it's really, I mean, the, that's kind of at the provider level, but there is different coding or things. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of what Deb is saying too, sometimes it's both. <laughs> so. Right, right. It, often both. That's 
that's exactly right, Bridget. On one tooth, it might be preventive and on another tooth, it might be that. And uh, there's a subtlety to what you said, Bridget. And I think it's really important because when we're trying to implement something new like this, we have a uh, scope of practice, we have uh, coding, and I'm a big believer in let's not code in a distorted way that we don't really understand what we did. And then uh, we also have reimbursement and there are three different things. And the sweet spot is when they all overlap to kids and adults with decay getting SDF. <laughs> so, sorry. Thank you. And Nancy Jost, I know we're at, at time, but we'd love to hear from you. Well, I was just wondering how um, we can make advocacy for this um, simple enough for people like me who aren't oral health professionals. Um, the medical field, oral health field, um, so sometimes feels really intimidating for mm -hmm. someone like me. And I would be happy to um, advocate, but I just need a little help doing it on a kind of simple message. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good role for the Minnesota Oral Health Coalition, frankly. Um, I think that's, I think that that's a, I hear a charge. I hear a, <laughs> this is something we need. Um, I think that, um, so I put that on my, I have my to-do list and I've actually have my highlighter from today and I'm going to add that Nancy and I, I love your feedback. Um, Nancy, there's a question here yeah. from Trisha wait, wait, too, wait, wait, that wait, maybe wait. we can oh. copy and we can send that forward to, um, to Deb. Or I'll have, I have a, I have a slide that tells about that and okay. yeah, about the alternate project and the <clears throat> pros and cons so I can get that uh, to Crystal. Uh, but I also just wanted to give one last opportunity. Dr. Jahani, you talked about some advocacy that you want to do on the medical side. Do you want to speak to that at all? I think that's a, such a great idea um, as far as advocacy, bringing the dental and uh, medical teams together. I think through the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians, that would be one way to do. And I'll be happy to talk to them, bring it up. Uh, I do actually have a meeting with them tonight at 730 for the wow. health equity meeting. So I definitely would bring this up and uh, hopefully there will be more opportunity to Minnesota and my family physicians to, to basically bring us together. That That's wonderful. And I and again, I love this integration piece because we really need, you know, we need to come together and, and we, have a, we have a family physician and then we have someone like Nancy Jost who is an advocate and an educator and so if, we, if we're all working together, um, the chances that we'll have success are so much greater. So I love that, thank you. Um, so I know great. we're over time, so maybe yeah. the last two don't slide, slides won't matter. I can just tell you, you'll get them in your packet. They were kind of like, what can we do next? And it includes yeah. some advocacy and so on. And then the last one was just Amos again, just, you know. Oh yes, thank you. Dynard and to, if you're, if you feel weary, think about Amos and we'll all keep going. And yeah, I'll, I'll put him back up. I thank you, Nancy, so yeah. much. Let's see. And I'll, everyone for, for, yeah. thanks everybody. And I know people have to run. This was fantastic. Thanks to our presenters. Um, and I'll share the information. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. It was, it was a great. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you, Dr. Jahani. Good to meet you. Bye, everybody.